we're going to be recording this meeting with the hopes that we will be sharing it. Um, we'll be sharing it uh, hopefully tomorrow with a link. It will email go out to all participants. So you'll be able to view this again. And then we also want it to be available for people who won't be, um, weren't able to join us today so that they will be um, uh, able to, to view and still take part. Um, okay, next slide, please. Uh, today is a little bit different than how we've normally done uh, Network Cafe. So normally we have the announcements at the end. Unfortunately, we will um, not likely have time for that today. So what we'd like to do instead is if you could use your, the chat function, and please go ahead now to um, make any announcements um, to everyone uh, and make the announcements that you need for the group. Uh, or that you'd like to share with the group. That would be uh, the best way to do that. Again, this will be visible and um, for everyone um, who is here today and it will also be visible when we repost it again tomorrow. So even though it's in the chat, it'll still be able to be shared. Okay, and then we have a couple features on Zoom we'd like to draw your attention to. So, um, at the beginning, the, we won't have much uh, participant engagement, but in the latter half, everyone will be hoping, will be hoping you'll be joining us in some conversation. So I think the best thing to do at that time would be to raise your hand if you'd like to speak. The way that you can do that in Zoom is in the participant panel. There is a, oh, sorry. Well, we're going to actually go through the, the toolbar at the bottom. There's the reactions um, on the far right. It's got a little smiley face. If you like what someone is saying, you can um, give a thumbs up and you can also give an applause, a clap. This is what mine looks like when I'm clapping or thumbs up. So you can just kind of agree with someone that way without chiming in. And, um, sorry, and then, so that's the reaction button. We also have the chat. The chat is available to um, write to everyone. Um, yeah, you can share information with everyone. That will be available in this, um, uh, in the main room. And then when we go into the breakout rooms, you'll also have a chat just for the breakout room. And then, sorry, the last part is the participant panel. I believe mine looks a little bit different because um, I am a, uh, a host, but on that, you should be able to, on your name, your, you should see your name on the side, you can click your name, and then there's a, a place there to raise your hand, where you can click raise hand. So if you have a question, then you're, you can be brought up to the top of the list, and we'll see your raised hand then. So we will be using that feature to kind of help move the conversation along and call on people, since Zoom is a, you know, a different, platform than if we're meeting face-to-face. -face. And with that, we will get started. I will hand it over to um, the Director of the Community Engagement Center, Dr. Dana Kibble. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and thanks so much for joining us. And as you heard, I'm the Director of the Community Engagement Center, and that was Marissa Warnock, who's our Volunteer and Program Specialist. And also, let me introduce the rest of the staff, Francine Redotta, who's our Senior Partnership Coordinator, Anthony Fajardo, who's our Volunteers in Service to America Specialist, um, Isabel Ibarra, our Resource Analyst, and Anne Moylan, who's a Faculty Associate, but who's also the incoming Director of the Community Engagement Center, and she will begin in August. As I look at the participant numbers, I'm so thrilled that there are so many of you joining us here today. It looks like there are more than 100 folks, and that, that's just fantastic. As you can tell by the invitation you've received today, this, is event, uh, this event is different from our usual gathering. And clearly much has happened and changed since our May meeting in May. Given all that's going on in the world today, the continuation of the pandemic, which continues to disproportionately impact communities of color, large-scale protests, and demands for an end to po police brutality and systemic racism throughout all U.S. institutions and numerous policy proposals and suggested changes 
to respond to deeply entrenched inequalities, we wondered how do we continue to do our work and engage one another and our communities in thoughtful and intentional ways that allow us to pursue our social justice and social change efforts. In short, how do we carry on? This is our second foray into the virtual world of large scale meetings. In today's cafe, uh, we will be joined by our feature speaker, Dr. Flojan Kofer. And then we will send all of you into several breakout rooms, which will be led by the following volunteer facilitators. Dr. Aja Holmes, Senior Associate Director, Residential Life and University Housing. Mimi Lewis, former field director, School of Social Work at Sac State, and who has recently taken a similar position at University of the Pacific. Dr. Robin Fisher, professor in the School of Music. Austin McInerney, senior facilitator, um, uh, senior mediator at Consensus and Collaboration Program. Ann Moylan, professor and incoming director, uh, and Francine Redotta. So let me now introduce our featured speaker. Dr. Flo Jean Kofer is an epidemiologist who serves as the Senior Director of Policy for Public Health Advocates. She oversees the state policy efforts and the All Children Thrive uh, CA Local Trauma Policy Initiative. Her professional interest is addressing emerging and persistent public health challenges through research and policy. She previously served as the Director of State Policy and Research. Prior to joining Public Health Advocates, she led the Preconception Health Initiative for the California Department of Public Health. Dr. Kofer received bachelor's degrees in chemistry and women's studies from Spelman College. Her public health training was at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where she earned a master's in public health and a doctorate in epidemiology. She is an alumna of California Epidemiologic Investigation Service and the Nehemiah Emerging Le Leaders Program. Dr. Kofer is deeply committed to civic engagement, having served in various capacities on local boards, committees, and missions, uh, commissions. And I am fortunate to be able to call her Madam Chair as we serve together under her leadership on the City of Sacramento Measure U Advisory Committee. Hopefully you were all able to see and hear Dr. Kofer's eloquent articulation and passionate engagement with Mayor Steinberg, which was in Tuesday's B. If you haven't had a chance to listen, I really encourage that you do. For her professional contributions and community participation, she was awarded the Young Professional of the Year Award by the Sacramento Urban League, the Exceptional Woman of Color Award by the Sacramento Cultural Hub, and the 40 Under 40 Award by the Sacramento Business Journal. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Flojan Kofer. Thank you so much, Dana. I really appreciate that. And I just want to say that during our meeting, I got to, I had two friends who screenshot you while you were on the screen and said, who is this and how do I get to meet her? <laughs> so the, the admiration for the work that you do goes both ways. And thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to be able to share with you um, and, to, and to sort of think through with you how we are, um, you know, approaching our work right now. And so I've kind of titled this talk, How Do We Function in 2020? And I had the pleasure of um, having a, a lengthier discussion. And I'm really glad that you all are going to be able to talk today with the Department of Social Services yesterday around what, what exactly are we doing? Like, can we just take a moment and recognize that 2020 has been a decade and a half a year? Um, you know, I, I saw something online very recently that was showing a woman kind of talking to her herself in, in January and she was like, you know, wow, these, these fires that are happening, that's really going to be the big story for 2020. And her current self was like, ah, I don't know about that, right? And so there are all these ways that the world that we live in has changed so much since we celebrated the new year just less than six short months ago. So part of what I think we need to talk about today, and I'm hoping that my screen hasn't frozen and we'll advance. Yes. So probably what we need to talk about today is really contextualizing what we've all been through together. Because a pandemic where our way of being has changed is the definition of a trauma. Um, and for those of you who maybe use the word trauma but are not ste steeped in this um, research, a trauma is an event or series of events or circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. And it has often lasting adverse effects on our, our ability to function, our mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well being. 
And so I think we've all been through that this year. Um, we have experienced a pandemic where our, our health is threatened, where we've been separated from many of the people that we love, and where there's a lot, a great amount of uncertainty, both in terms of, are we going to contract this virus and what does that mean? Um, as we're learning, but literally building the runway as we move. And also in the sense of, we didn't have the, the usual places that we would go to be able to relieve our stress. Sports are shut down. We can't gather together in our normal watering holes. We can't get together in our, our places of, of faith and worship. And so, and we can't get together, you know, with people who don't live in our, our household for a lot of this year. And so that really has changed our coping mechanisms as well as what we're experiencing while we're going through this collective trauma. And so that must be acknowledged because we've talked about it as a pandemic, but we haven't really talked as much about the impact of that pandemic on us and how traumatizing that can be. And so the reason I bring it up in that way is because, you know, when we're experiencing a trauma, there is a, and especially a persistent trauma, um, there is a chronic stress that's associated with it. And so I'm hoping that you all can, can identify with this list because I have felt all of these things over the last few months. Um, I've had trouble concentrating and remembering things. I have had difficulty sleeping, either difficulty falling asleep or waking up way earlier than I should have. I have noticed several days that it was, you know, eight or 9 p.m. and I hadn't actually eaten anything all day. Um, I have felt like the slightest thing could totally set me off. Um, I had no intention of go of like, you know, having that exchange with the mayor on Monday night, but I was just so, you know, frustrated, right? And so part of that comes from this feeling of, of just like, this has to come out somewhere. Um, we're on guard, both because there's a virus out here that, that you know, um, can, can harm us, and also because we're not exactly sure what is safe and what isn't. One day we're being told don't wear masks. The next day masks, you know, are required to be able to go into certain, certain businesses and frequent certain places. And all of this is happening, again, while we're disconnected from our friends and family. And so you'll commonly hear this refrain of we're in this together. And I totally believe that, right? And I'd like to use the analogy of the Titanic. The Titanic, for those of you who maybe missed the, the late 90s, um, <laughs> when the movie was all the rage, um, was a ship that sank in 1912 and it was deemed the unsinkable ship. And much like the Titanic, we are all in this together. There's nobody who has not been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but, Similar to the Titanic, more third-class passengers died than first-class passengers. Men died more than women and children, and first-class women were the most likely to survive compared to third-class men. And so we could have a whole conversation about whether this is hubris or ignorance, um, right? We didn't have enough lifeboats. We, you know, they didn't have enough lifeboats. They acted too late. Um, they thought it was an unsinkable ship, um, despite the fact that there was a known threat of icebergs. And I think all of this really is apropos for the COVID-19 pandemic. We did not engage in emergency preparedness, even though I'm an epidemiologist, we've known for a while that there could be the next you know, pandemic that really could significantly cripple our economy and devastate our, our population in terms of its health. And then we took a while to actually roll out the protections that would really help us. So we had to reach the pandemic peak before we were able to actually get the cases to start going down. And part of that was because we thought this just could never happen. So a lot of these are parallels. But the, the real takeaway here is that yes, we're all on the boat together, but our likelihood of survival and the way that gonna, we're gonna be impacted is very different based on where we are are um, in our position in society. And there's been a lot of conversation about sort of how this has impacted people and, and especially the disproportionality in the Black and Latino or Latinx communities. And I just want to just call out because it can't be understated that, you know, the disparities here are entirely explained by structural racism because there is historical and ongoing cycle that's driven by social determinants of health. And this results in an increased risk of infection and increased risk of complications. And what we mean by that is that if we think even about the idea that we've all been working from home, and I've heard that refrain a lot, but actually only 35% of um, Black people and only 25% of Latinos have been working from home. Um, in fact, they, they are overrepresented in the populations that are deemed essential workers. Um, and so, and in addition to that, many have also lost jobs. So if they're at home, they're not working from home. They're at home because they've been laid off. And so that has a big impact on 
A, stress levels, because we know that, that you know, being unemployed um, and financial considerations are a major cause of stress. But also, if we think about where people live, um, people are more likely to be, people who have lower incomes are more likely to be living in housing that's close together in densely populated cities um, where they're reliant on transit to be able to get around. And transit was obviously, um, you know, significantly reduced during the time when we were all um, intending to shelter in place. And so all of these things come together with our healthcare system um, that was significantly, you know, um, under, under uh, resourced in terms of protective equipment, um, as well as the structural racism that undergirds all of that, why people are more likely to have been in jobs that, um, that were laid off, why the access to health care often is challenging from a transportation perspective and an access perspective, but also from a quality of care perspective, and even the stressors that people are experiencing. So we have to recognize that this pandemic has not affected all of us in the same way, and that is going to lead to different outcomes in terms of, in terms of what we're experiencing, even if we're not the ones who have contracted the virus. And then this happened. So in the midst of a pandemic, we finally began to have a reckoning of some of the real challenges that we've had in terms of police violence and how that often operates on racialized lenses. And so we watched um, for days on end as there were violent interactions between police forces and the people that they um, are sworn to protect and serve. And it was quite scary. The National Guard was called in in many places, including Sacramento. Um, and there were a lot of conversations. And now we're starting to see companies and organizations saying, what can we do? How can we help in the midst of already having been disconnected and in the midst of a trauma? So we have to recognize that what's happened here is that we have not only had an individual trauma, but collectively we've, we've experienced what we call a community trauma. And a community trauma is when members of a collective are subjected to a horrendous event that marks the group consciousness by shaping their memories and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. And, and you know, racism is one of those things that's a collective trauma. And when events like this happen with the death of Joy, George Floyd and the death of Breonna Taylor, and more recently, you know, the deaths that happened in, in Atlanta and the hangings that happened, two of which were in Southern California, that has a triggering effect on people who have lived through racialized violence their entire lives and also have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And so it can't be understated just how serious this is. So when we think about this, we also are trying to do our work, especially as nonprofits. I am the senior director and on the executive team for a nonprofit that is trying to do work right now, a policy-driven, you know, equity-focused nonprofit. And so we've had to really think about how are we doing our work and in particular, how are we taking care of our staff? Because we don't want to burn them out because we are all part of this community and are often incredibly impacted by this. And so one of the things that we have, uh, have done, and I really just kind of want to talk through some of the potential strategies for really trying to support staff, um, is that we increased our support check-ins. So three times a week at noon, we have a 30-minute Zoom that, you, that we've asked all of our staff to opt into at least one time per week with their camera on. And the reason for that is instead of doing an opt-out situation where, or an opt-in situation, situation where you, you have you you know have the choice to do it we put it on the calendar and made it mandatory because one of the things we know for sure and I'm gonna speak um, you know very candidly for all of us here is that people in helping professions are terrible at self-care we take care of everyone else but we are the people who will give until it hurts and we don't often do a great job of, of really monitoring our own self-care and so we knew that if we offered this as an option people would not opt in because they would take care of everyone else first. But many of our staff are parenting children who are now at home with them all the time. And uh, the joke that I said to another one of our Measure U committee members on Monday night is, the benefit is that you've never had this much time with your kids, but also you've never had this much time with your kids. And so recognizing that, you know, that can be a stressor that we're all trying to adjust to new ways of working. And so what we've done is we actually have on those calls, there's no work being done um, in terms of, you know, actual content work. Instead, it's an opportunity for us to reflect. Um, we have several therapists who are on our, uh, on our staff. And so they often will lead us through meditations and mindfulness exercises. They will give us homework, like as you can see on the example here, 
where we were doing a screen share and, um, and trying to talk about how we felt and what we we're grateful for to do a mind shift and really kind of help us bring awareness to what we're feeling and experiencing. And it's been a great way to, for us to stay connected while we are physically remote and also a way for us to be able to really pay attention to ourselves for at least 30 to 90 minutes per week. Um, the other thing that we've done is, I, I'm sure you've all had this where you call somebody on the phone or you start a meeting, you say, how are you? And then 45 minutes later, when the therapy session is over, you're like, great, we had eight things on the agenda and we didn't get to that. And so part of what this has been doing for us is allowing us to have that space where we can talk about where we, how we are, but then also moving beyond how are you into um, the more specifics of what's happening right now, because sometimes how are you is triggering. You're going about your day and you found a way to manage and then someone says, how are you? And you're like, well, I'm black in a pandemic and dealing with structural racism and I have not had a break for my kids in three weeks. Yeah, I'm not doing well, right? And it, it can kind of take you into a spiral. And so we, we've actually come up with a list of check-in questions that we can ask to one another. Things, if you're calling somebody out of the blue, like, hey, how are, you know, what, what are you, what am I interrupting while I'm calling you? Um, instead of, hey, how are you? Um, and if we're starting at the, at the beginning of a meeting, we say, what's one thing that has gone really well for you today? Or what's one thing you're grateful for? Um, or what's the most exciting thing you're looking forward to? As a way to just do a mental shift away from the, the way that our brains often function when we are in trauma and when we're experiencing stress, which is to catastrophize. And so that's been a really helpful thing to be able to allow us to have that mental shift and to not constantly be dwelling on what's happening while also focusing on the great work that we're doing that is equity focused and helping to address some of the structural issues that we're facing. Another thing that we've done um, someone said they'd like to get the list of questions. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, and there's actually an article that we pulled them from. So happy to, to put that in the chat. Um, another thing that we've done in terms of support opportunities is reprioritizing the workload. And again, part of this is, is preaching to myself because I know that when it comes to helping professions and people who, who love to do this kind of work, we are terrible at prioritizing. Everything is a priority because we understand that all these things are, are interconnected. And so um, we use the management center. We love it. Um, all of our staff have been trained on it. Even our staff who don't manage other people have gone through some of their trainings for just how to manage projects. Um, the management center, for those of you who aren't uh, aware, is actually a, a great training ground for nonprofits. They also train you on campaigns. They are the organization that trained the Obama campaign on how to manage itself and you know be able to be in 50 states and doing doing great work in that way. Um, and we have found their resources so helpful. Most of them are available free online, but if you take some of their trainings, um, you'll really get a lot out of it, including their books and all their materials and even free coaching um, as you may be managing staff or managing projects. And so reprioritizing our workload has really been sitting down with each of our staff and saying, what are you working on now? What were, your, what were you working on before? What are we going to work on for now? And what are we not going to do? And what are we going to pause for now that we may pick up later, but that we don't have the capacity to do? Because otherwise, we're in a situation where we are still trying to do everything that we were doing and not recognizing the science behind our brains can't handle that right now. We can't operate at 100% capacity. And it is actually not a trauma-informed practice to try to do so right now. So we need to decide what are the things that are highest priority, and we need to give specific direction to our staff, for those of you who are managers around, what are we going to pause and what are we not going to do? The other thing that we need to do is we need to be able to do that as an organization ourselves, because we can't, we, we can't always um, rely on individual staff to make those decisions. We need to be thinking overall, what is our strategic focus right now? What are the things that we absolutely have to do? And how can we make sure that we're dedicating our available resources to that while putting some things on pause or not doing them? And so I like to think of this as the sort of glass balls versus rubber balls. If you're, if you're juggling and you have glass balls, you cannot drop them because if you do, they will shatter and break. But rubber balls, you can let bounce in the corner for a while because there is no you know, negative consequence to not pick, to juggling those balls. You just don't have them in the air. And so really being able to identify which are glass and which are rubber is incredibly helpful. Um, another way that we've gone about this is really thinking about flexible scheduling because Again, many of our staff now have caregiving responsibilities, um, now, you know, now have both for parents as well as for children or maybe even um, other people in their houses. And so we really have to think about what does it mean? 
I did this because I have so many staff on my team that I changed, I actually stopped and changed my work day from five, from the normal sort of nine to five or six to 5.30 AM to 2 PM. Because what I found for myself was that sitting in my house without getting outside during all of the daylight hours was deteriorating my own mental health. And I needed to be able to have a break while the sun was still out so that I could do things. The other part of the, the challenge was that when I was working those typical hours, every single moment of every day was caught up in a meeting and I had no time to read email, to write, to think, to process, to do any of the things that I actually needed to do. And so luckily now that I'm up before everybody else is, I get between 5.30 a.m. and about 8.30 or 9 a.m. before my first meeting where I can actually get some things done. And it's been incredibly helpful in terms of actually getting the, my reduced workload. Well, my workload hasn't been reduced, but we're working on it. Um, I told you, I'm a, I'm a work in progress too. So I'm this, this is as much for me as it is for you. But, um, you know, get, working on the things that I'm working on and also then being able to be fully present for the things I need to do with everyone else throughout the rest of the day. And then lastly, we, you know, our organization, our, our executive team really sat down, we polled our staff and asked what would be most helpful to you. And many of them were experiencing the same things we were, which is an increase in email work, email load, an increase of, of everybody wanting to have Zoom meetings because they wanted to co connect people together and feeling the, the Zoom fatigue and feeling really burned out. And so we've now instituted, first we, we looked at maybe closing one day, maybe even shutting down for a little while to allow people to readjust. And everybody said that that would be more stressful to them than helpful. And that's one of the reasons why we poll our staff because sometimes the things that we think might help, they actually feel stressed out about. And so instead what they said would be helpful was to be able to have quiet hours. And so our quiet hours are from two to 5 p.m. on Tuesdays and Fridays. And so that is a time where you, we don't schedule meetings, we don't take phone calls and we actually have the time to ourselves to work. And so it similarly works the way that my 5.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. kind of time works in my schedule or my 5.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. time works in that it's your time to not be disturbed. Um, and so really considering for your organization what might be best, you may not be able to, to use that particular tool or your quiet hours may need to be different or you may, may prefer closures versus quiet hours because the type of work you do doesn't work, but really just sitting down with your staff and asking, what do you need? Um, when I talked to the Department of Social Services yesterday, their staff talked about needing ergonomic equipment at home because they were sitting on their couch and now their backs are starting to hurt and they, you know, and they, don't, they don't have printing capabilities and they can't e-fax from home. And so just sitting down and asking what would make your life easier and then engaging in what I call a design thinking process around how that might work for you would be a great way to be able to help to support your staff because we're trying to manage our stress and what we need to do as an organization is think about the social e and emotional and, and tangible support that we can provide to folks. So I know you're going to be breaking out into groups um, soon. I always like to, to um, remind us that what we're trying to do is kind of a CQI process. I try to apply CQI to everything. Um, if, you if you ever come to a barbecue at my house afterward, I'll be like, okay, so what went well, what didn't go well, and what do we want to make sure we do next time? I do it for almost everything in my life. And so I leave you with this as a way to just constantly evaluate your week, um, evaluate how you're doing, is what is, you know, what are you currently doing that you're going to stop doing because maybe it isn't working. Maybe you're asking your staff to do 100% of work right now and you haven't reprioritized and that probably needs to stop um, what are you what haven't you done that you're going to start doing because it may work right so are you going to engage you know with your staff in a different way are you going to find some time to be able to um, incorporate some of the tools we've talked about here or other ones that may or maybe you're going to pull, pull your staff and figure out what they'd like to see and what are you already doing because you all are amazing that's why you're doing great work i know a lot of the names and organizations on this um on this call and so what are you already doing that's working what are you what have you already figured out that works great for you and just to remind yourself to pat you on the back and say this works don't drop it when we do our CU my process. We know it works. So let's double down and keep that going. And so I just want to, I'm going to look through the, the comments now and see, but I want to pass it back um, and prepare for our breakouts and um, chat. Wow. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you really packed a lot in in a short <laughs> period of time. So, you know, that that's so great. You've given us so much to think about. 
And as you said, yes, we are going to go out to the breakout rooms, but I want to let folks know that Dr. Kofer is going to stay throughout this time and then rejoin us at the very end after we have some reporting out from the breakout room. So if you have questions, uh, you can uh, hold on to them or put them in the chat and we'll, we'll come back to them a little bit later. So before we go into the chat rooms or to the break rooms, breakout room, uh, we're gonna spend about 25, 30 minutes there. And before we get going, we're I, a couple of housekeeping items. The first is we've decided we'd like to share some group agreements. So Anthony, can you please uh, post the group agreement so, um, slide? So these are uh, a couple of agreements to make sure that uh, we all feel comfortable uh, chatting and participating. Uh, please be present. Turn off your cell phones if you can. I know that many of you are multitasking. Approach these discussions with an open mind. And if you can avoid multitasking, please, please do so. Uh, what's said here stays here. Of course, that's within the bounds of a virtual world. Um, so. Do, do the best you can to be respectful of that. Monitor your own participation. Everyone should participate, but none should dominate. Are there any other group agreements that anyone would like to, to share or for us to, to consider as well? Please maybe raise your hand or put that in the chat and we'll add it to this list. Anything else you'd like us to add? Okay, if not, I'm gonna turn it back over to Marissa, who's going to take care of moving all of us to breakout rooms and we will see you soon. Okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna review for a moment. We'll be in the breakout rooms for 30 minutes. Um, when we have about five minutes left, I will send a um, alert to all rooms. So you'll get a, a pop up on your screen that says there's five minutes left. When there's 60 seconds left, uh, again, there'll be another pop up in your in your screen. It'll say 60 seconds and then it'll count down at that time when the conversation is wrapped up. You can leave the room and you'll rejoin us here. If you don't click leave room, you will automatically just be pulled back at the end of those 60 seconds. So if everyone could just sit tight, um, I have uh, made the breakout rooms and you'll all be sent in just a moment. You will also have to agree to join them, I believe. Um, so if you are on a call and you are not actually, um, uh, if you're calling from your phone and you don't have a screen, I will do my best to um, make sure you can join them. This is also a great time if you feel comfortable, you can turn your monitors back on or your cameras back on. And um, we'd love to see everyone's faces. And just one more reminder that when you're in the breakout rooms, um, keep it as a default, keep your microphone unmuted so nobody, can, uh, nobody catches any background noise. And then turn your mic on when it's your turn to talk. Okay, thank you. Freaks you all out, but some of this technology kind of, st I'm still a little freaked out by it that I'm here one minute, I see people, and then people are gone, and then we're back. So, welcome back. Glad to see everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed your breakout rooms as much as I did. We had a great group, great conversation. And what I'd like to do now is just uh, take a couple of minutes to uh, ask for uh, the reporter, the note taker, or whoever from the breakout room to. Uh, to see if they'd be willing to share with us. So I'm probably gonna call on the facilitators uh, from the groups and see if they can call on their uh, reporter. So I see Aja. So Aja, may I ask you to ask your person to share out? Yes, um, Rosemary. Okay, thank you. Can, can you all hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we had a really great conversation. Thank you all so much for providing the space for that. Um, the first question was about how do we protect physical, mental, and emotional health. We said role modeling to others, making sure that we are taking our own advice, checking in with each other at meetings, even if that lasts the whole meeting. Some of us are seeing folks outside still physically distancing apart. All of us um, suggested wearing masks and encouraging others to wear masks. We noted that the governor came out today and said that we're requiring masks. Um, sometimes we just need to be able to talk, very conscious about where we're going and protecting our own health so we can protect the physical health of others. 
Someone provided weekly Wednesday um, funny little memos out to staff to not put pressure on themselves and to just, you know, be to not be super productive and don't put that pressure. Um, and then uh, Aja had mentioned at the beginning of this, there was a Facebook thing going around, like, if you don't come out of quarantine with a new hobby, a new language, blah, 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 like, what have you been doing with yourself? And it's really taking a step back from that idea, nixing that idea and really understanding that we are going through trauma and that slowing down is okay and to be expected and to kind of enjoy that process and trust that process. Um, that was the first question. Do you want me to go on to the second question? Well, let's uh, actually, if you could hold off on that and let's sure. hear from other folks and then we'll see how much time we have. Hopefully we'll have enough time to hear from both, both groups. Um, Anne, could you please go ahead and uh, ask your person? Well, I kind of am my person. I had a great group, but nobody wanted to be the uh, spokesperson. So um, what we talked about was uh, the use of music and the use of meditation um, in terms of how we take care of ourselves and also really picking up on what Dr. Kofer said about you know, self-care and then the importance of listening. Um, the importance of listening to our colleagues as well as listening to ourselves. That's just our first part. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, we uh, also did not have a volunteer uh, for the, to be the reporter, so I served that role and uh, had, had a good discussion, a uh, number of people contributing and a um, couple ideas uh, that came forward. Uh, was to uh, create a comfortable working space at home uh, to allow you to, to be productive, but also to, uh, to give you the, the physical space that you need to, to think and, and do the work that you need to do. Um, there was a suggestion one person had was to, uh, to get outside of your house. And for her, that meant getting in her car and just going for a drive uh, in the neighborhood, which allowed her to listen to some loud music and sort of check out mentally from all the other things that were going on around her. Um, so the car became a safe space. Um, having one-on-one -on -one calls with friends, just using the phone and, and going on a short walk during that call just to, to chat with people and to, to, to reconnect um, using the phone call uh, as a tool to do that. Uh, and then and lastly, um, uh, visiting with people at a safe distance, uh, you know, at their homes um, to sort of have a physical um, check-in with, with people that were at risk or um, were, were stuck to home. And this person was a social worker. And so instead of meeting in their home, she's still checking in with them on their front porch and letting them know that she's there uh, to talk with. So trying to create as much of a personal connection as possible uh, using the tools at our disposal. Thank you, Austin. Uh, Robin. Uh, Leslie Goto was our reporter. Take it away. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, some of the things we covered that weren't covered already with the other groups was um, care buddies. Um, someone said that at their work, they had a care buddy. And now because of this COVID um, pandemic, they are doing care buddy groups where they check in regularly. They get together to vent, get together virtually, to vent and not necessarily talk about work. Um, they have staff meetings where they ask instead of, um, you know, how are you? They ask, what's your happy place? They focus on positivity. Um, it was also brought up about um, um, how to talk about how people are caregiving because it's not just work, it's they may have family members at home, children they need to take care of, older family members, um, to let them know that they're not alone in caregiving and um, just to um, check in on a family's wellness. Um, let's see, and I think, is that it, Robin? Yeah, that was it. Great. Thank you. Um, we'll do Mimi, and then um, I will ask Joan from our group. I'll ask you to chime in and talk about what we talked about. Okay, so um, my group's um, person was Susan Serenas. Hi. Um, the couple of things that came out of our group, um, no talked about a healing circle that they have, which is a loosely guided conversation 
a Zoom session, of course, for staff where they can express themselves and provide mutual support. And it's guided by their wellness staff. Um, there's also communications by email and keeping in touch that Sylvia from Sac State mentioned. And then Rebecca from the Agency on Aging um, talked about how they would randomly call each other throughout the day and maybe get into groups of four from different departments. So you're mixing with others and um, meeting about once per week. Okay, thank you. And Joan, if there's anything else uh, that you, we haven't yet heard, if you could please share it with uh, the group. Sure. Uh, we had many of the same things, but one thing that was very interesting was um, Alexis from Red Cross. She had just joined her Red Cross community a week before COVID started. And so she was not connected with anyone at that point, really. So she said she took it upon herself to set up a one-on-one -on -one coffee break or lunch break with one of her staff members so that she could get to know them and, and know their faces. So put that together with emails that she was involved in. Um, they also had weekly staff meetings that were purely fun related where they would just ask a question and everybody would pipe in. The last question was to rate yourself from one to 10 on how you're doing with your self care. And so what are you doing to take care of yourself as well? So that was interesting. Um, the other thing is when were there when people the the main consensus in our group was to look out for what's good so always recognize each other for achievements and give kudos um, and consider positive things just so that it's not always you know the bad going on and that you're frustrated or whatever uh, one more thing is that um, remembering to take a break get outside in the sunshine Get that vitamin D going <laughs> to help your mental attitude, um, just to kind of breathe, get some fresh air, and to make sure that your workspace is doing the right thing for you and that you walk away when you're done working. And remember, even though it might be in a personal space as well, work is work, personal is personal. So try to keep, keep your uh, schedule regular, so. That's it. Well, thank you. And the second question is more about uh, things to help support your organization to function better. And there were three key questions. One thing that you're going to continue to do, one thing you're going to stop doing, and a new thing that you're going to start doing. We don't have a lot of time because we still want to hear some final thoughts from Dr. Kofer, but um, would any of the facilitators, or any folks like to chime in and offer Maybe just one of those things, like a really great key thing about continuing, stopping, or starting. Let's start with uh, Mimi. Is there something with your group? We didn't come up with a whole this part of the conversation, I think probably because we were running out of Um, we didn't come up with a lot from this conversation because well, I think we were running out of time and we spent more on the first question. So um, the one thing I didn't get a chance to talk about is one thing I started was um, meditation sessions at the uh, end of the day. There's three of them, uh, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And I think that helps me keep grounded. Um, they're only 30 minutes and it's, it's 30 minutes of time where you don't have to really think about pressures, um, what you have to do, your mind can get really clear. So I think that if you haven't tried some type of meditation session, that that can be very helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, Robin, one thing from your group. Yeah, Leslie, maybe you want to share about the racial healing circles. Oh, yes. Um, uh, there was talk of deep, of trying to be, get into deep listening and not cross conversation. And so that led us into um, racialized, the racialized trauma in addition to COVID. So how um, 
sharing stories with um, organizations like Project Optimism. Um, if there's a need for racial healing and how that can, that's something that can start. Because um, we didn't cover anything to stop. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Aja, anything you'd like to share? And we might, this might be one of the last things. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for this, but let's, mm -hmm. let's hear what your group might have to share. Oh, Rosemary, did you have one? If not, I have one off the top of my head. Yeah, go for it, Aja. Um, I, I, I honestly thought we, um, we were gonna continue with the asking how you're doing and go a little bit beyond that. And if it, if it takes up your whole meeting, that's more important is let your staff members really kind of process what they're doing and what they're going through. So really have some of that time um, to provide that healing time. That's one of the things we're going to continue doing that. A couple of folks said that in my room. Okay. I, I think that's a great one to, to end with. And, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Kofer back for some um, closing thoughts on today. Oh, good. I stepped away briefly to you to, for a bio break. So I just wanted to make sure I hadn't missed my cue to wrap up. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, what I heard from the report outs is that there is a lot of support that you all are already providing to your staff and that some of you are have, have identified some ways that you can be more supportive of your team and some things that you need in the process to be able to do that. Um, and so that's really a first step. Now you have to figure out, you know, the resources and the timing and how this works. I really want to encourage you, especially those of you in leadership, don't do this alone ask your staff because you know just like what we do with community engagement the adage is always nothing about us without us um, and so just because you're the leaders of the organization and the one responsible for making the decision doesn't mean that you do it without their input and their guidance um, the whole that that will make you the best and most effective leader at doing this and then also recognizing that you know i, I think it's really important to call out that because we talked about all being in this together, but experiencing it differently, that your black and brown staff are having a different experience right now. And so it is important for leadership to acknowledge that, but I want to be really clear also, and I didn't say this earlier, and so I'll say it now, that do not, please don't participate in the performance for black lives. And that's what I've been calling the open up my Amazon and black lives matter is there and all of that. And that's nice, but that's not the support that people want right now. What they want to do is really think about your organization, think about your institutions and how they function, and then say, what do we actually need to do to be able to address the needs both in the community and also within the organization? Because we have to secure our masks before helping others. And so if your black and brown staff are not feeling supported from the organization, we need to take a first look internally and say, how are we functioning? How are we treating people? Um, what is our what is our own implicit bias and that sort of thing and that's the first place to go before we start writing checks to Black Lives Matter and doing all of, like I said what the what is the performance of, for Black Lives we actually need to value them and you start with your own staff so please keep that in mind as we're coming up with um, with solutions that we want to support the entire team but we also recognize that some folks in the team are really experiencing this at a lot of intersections and we need to both check in on them we need to also rec we need to ask them what their needs are and what they'd like to see and really on this we should be deferring to some leadership um, and that leadership doesn't mean taxing your your you know black and brown staff with the additional burden of having to do this work. What it means is there's lots of scholarship that dates back for generations about what we can do about this. And so if you're one of the leaders and you're not a person of color, look to that scholarship and see what it says. Because the other thing that's been really taxing is that in the last three weeks, everybody's been like, oh my gosh, racism is a problem. Black people help me figure out racism. And we're like, we're too busy trying to navigate racism. We don't have time to teach you how to navigate it. There's scholarship out there to do that please defer to it and check in later. So I just want to remind us <laughs> that that's one of the ways that we can support our staff is by also doing the work. Um, so I'm hoping that that will work. My slides will be available um, to you. They also have the links in there for the check-in questions as well as the, the management center resources. And so it was a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for the work that you've done for the breakout sessions and the reflection you've done. And I wish you really well in your implementation process because that's what comes next. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kofer. It's just been amazing and inspirational to have you. Um, I want to direct folks to check out the chat because folks who didn't get a chance to share out, um, at the end with from your breakout group, people are adding that in the chat. 
We will be making this recording available on the CEC website as well as the information from Dr. Kofer. So um, I want to thank you and I believe we have a, a final slide to tell you about uh, next month. A thank you also to our, our sponsor SMUD and thanks again to the, the amazing staff at Community Engagement Center. Uh, you all made this happen. Kudos to you. Thank you again. And um, do we have the thank you and the next meeting slide? I think we do. Um, Don't believe it was updated, but next meeting is July 18th, 2020. And I will put that in the chat as well. And we will be discussing uh, COVID uh, nonprofits in the COVID-19 world. It's actually July 16th. Oh, I'm sorry, July 16th. July 16th. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Um, have a great day, get outside. I'm actually a professor of leisure studies, so I really, I recommend my prescription is go have some leisure every day. So take care, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.